Hello, my name is Nathan. You're watching Nice at Dice, and today I'm taking a look at this game, Freedom Rings. It's an economic game for two to four players uh, in which you are rolling dice, moving around the board, claiming properties, and it sounds a lot like Monopoly, but is it like Monopoly? Well, it's actually quite different. We're going to take a look at it, and then we'll come back here and I'll give you my thoughts on it. All right, here is the game of Freedom Rings set up for two players, and right away, as you can see, it has a, a very beautiful board. I like the bright colors. The graphic design is very clean. Everything is, is has a nice look to it. Very easy to decipher what everything is. And, you know, at a glance, you know what's going on in the game. The board really is the centerpiece of the game. You have three rings. The rings that Freedom Rings is talking about. You have a uh, rural ring around the outside. You have the suburban ring in the middle and then in the very center you have the urban ring and then you have this uh, area and here this is where you track what the game calls power player moves i'll talk about that a little bit later but just focusing on these rings to start with you'll notice that each ring is split up into different spaces each of these spaces is called a property there are different types of properties we have some agriculture properties over here we have service properties we have what they call industry, but it's basically manufacturing properties. We have uh, culture properties, virtual properties, all right? And you have a few of these parks, which are basically free spaces. So you have these different types of properties. And the different types of properties are important because at the beginning of the game, each player is going to get a set of these seven cards. And these are goal cards. So each player gets the same seven to choose from. You're going to choose one of these goal cards and keep it secret and that is going to be the goal you are aiming for over the course of the game. So for example, for the agriculture goal, it'll tell you in a two-player game you want to have 21 points to win. So if this is your goal, in order to uh, win the game, you're going to have to have 21 points, and those 21 points have to come specifically from agriculture properties. Well, how many points is an agricultural property worth? Well, you can see in the bottom left corner of each space, there's a number, number one over here. So this property is worth one point. But as you move through the circles towards the big center of the board, you see that the, the property values go up. So an agricultural property in the suburban ring will be worth three, and in the urban ring is worth eight. So that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to accumulate those properties of the right type, worth the right amount, but you also have to subtract from the value of your properties any of these debt tokens that you might have so if you have for example uh 10 debt represented by this one token and you have the agriculture goal you're actually going to need a total of 31 points from agriculture okay so that's how that works and there's uh basically five goals that are all the just the different types of property and then there's a uh, diversification goal where you have to have at least one square or one property in each of the different industries or the different fields. And you have to have 46 points total from all your properties to win. And then there's also a wealth goal where you're not necessarily trying to acquire properties or any types of properties. You just want to have the most wealth total. Wealth being basically the value of all your properties plus all your cash minus all your debt. This goal works a little bit differently from the others in that uh, you can't just declare victory once you have accumulated a certain amount of wealth. Instead, you have to wait for someone else to declare victory from their goal, like say agriculture. And then if you have more total wealth than the player who's going for the agriculture goal, you can step in and say, nope, actually I won with the wealth goal. So you're gonna choose one of these, let's say the agriculture goal for the blue player and let's just say culture for the red player and uh, you're going to set these aside just to be clear i took both of those cards out of the same set but each player does have their own set of cards all right you could potentially be going for the same goal um, and that becomes more likely if you have more players each player also has a set of these rings these are what you use to claim property at the beginning of the game each player is going to choose one agriculture property on the rural ring so the blue player has claimed this property down here the red player has claimed this one up here and you're going to have 
these little pieces here that you use to move around the board um, and they track your your progress around each of the rings you're going to start out with one on the rural ring but over the course of the game you're going to add a couple more to the board putting one on each ring eventually all right on your turn there's a few different things you can do but the average turn is going to look something like this for the blue player roll a die move that many spaces one two three four and then you have the choice to either claim this property or any other property on the same ring so i am on uh, this agriculture property blue is going for agriculture so might as well claim that property with the blue ring all right normally in order to claim a property you have to pay a number of uh, dollars basically equal to the value the point value of that property nobody starts out with any money however um, the game does include a nice stack of uh, money here this is paper money which um, is not the greatest um, but I will say it is it has a nice uh, thickness to it all right this isn't like your flimsy monopoly prop uh, money it's a step up from that so it's nice enough but you don't start out with any money so what are you going to do well you have to take on debt anyone can freely take on as much debt as they want to pay for anything they need to pay for okay so um, I would take on one debt to pay for this property however as an exception to the rule um, agriculture properties on the rural ring are free if you land on them so in this case I wouldn't have to pay anything I just claim the property now let's take a look at the red player he's going to do something similar on his turn he's going to roll he's going to move four spaces one two three four that'll put him here this is the uh, industry um, it's an industry property but he's not particularly in interested in industry he wants culture so after moving i can choose any other space on this ring and there's a culture space right here so let's jump him to there and claim that property all right now the culture spaces aren't free for anyone to to take so he's going to have to take on some debt so he's going to take one debt and now we're going to continue around so the the blue player is going to take another turn he's going to move three spaces one two three um, again it's agriculture he can claim it for free and why not because he's going for agriculture the red player is going to go again and uh he's rolling four so now here he's moving one two three two things are happening first He's going to jump this line here and come over to this property and every time you cross this line this is called uh, pay interest street okay so every time you cross this line you have to pay interest on any money you owe he has uh one he's one dollar in debt so you have to start paying interest as soon as you have at least ten dollars in debt and it's one dollar per ten dollars so right now he's good he doesn't have to pay the interest okay but once he had 10 or more dollars in debt he would have to start paying interest so that's one thing that happens when he crosses this line the other thing is he's going to land on a property here that belongs to the blue player so anytime you land on someone else's property just like in monopoly you have to pay uh, rent to them equal to the value of that property so now red player's got to pay one dollar to the blue player again red player doesn't have any money but he can take one debt to get a dollar to give to the blue player blue player is going to go again and move around all right that's the main thing that you're going to be doing on your turn however you have some other options for example the blue player now controls um, three different uh, agriculture properties so at the beginning of his turn instead of rolling and moving his guy uh, well first of all let's just say here's a, another option he always has is at the beginning of the turn he could say instead of moving on this uh you know rural ring i want to move on the suburban ring or even the urban ring he can roll for that and introduce a new guy to the board starting out from the interest road here and moving around that many spaces so one two three four he'd land there he'd have to decide if he wants to buy that or if he wants to buy another space somewhere else all right so you always have that option but you can also do this um, before you roll the die you can say i'm going to consolidate so i'm going to consolidate this property and this property so you're going to remove your rings from those you're giving up those properties and instead you're going to put one ring on a property of the same type on the next ring 
in. So now he's claiming this property. That's a key move to make because he's trading two properties worth one each for a single property worth three. Then the guy, his, his, his mover on that uh, ring is going to move up to the space he just took space he just consolidated to, and then he's going to roll and move again. One, two, three, four. So you're generally always rolling and moving um, just to keep you moving around the board so that you periodically have to pay interest, and so you might land on other people's properties and have to pay them rent. All right? So that's another option. A third option you can do is as you accumulate more properties, right, as you move around and you pick up more properties around the board. At a certain point, you're going to have enough properties on a ring to become a power player and make a power player move. And that's what this section right in the center of the board is all about. So what you can do here, once you have uh, enough properties, let's say Blue had enough properties in the uh, suburban ring, he can use one of his helicopter tokens. He's got these little helicopter tokens. Um, they have a, a minus on the tail, or you can flip them over and they have a plus on the tail. And he can land this on any of these rooftops over here. So, for example, he could land his over here on this I. I stands for interest. When he does that, he can adjust the interest rate up or down by one. So the interest rate can change. If the interest rate, for example, were three, then when someone crosses this line here, they'd have to pay uh, three interest on every 10 debt that they have. Okay, so that's one thing he could do. Or he could land uh, over here on one of these G's, right? So he could land on the G. G stands for goal. He could switch out his goal card. He'd reveal what his goal card was, put it aside, and then secretly pick one from the remaining cards, a new goal. All right, so you can change your goal. Or he could land on one of these P's over here. So he's working off of this ring, the suburban ring. So he'd land on uh, this P here in the middle, which points to the number two, and he could adjust the value of all the properties in this ring either up or down by two. If you go for the, the urban ring, it's up or down by three, and if you go for the um, rural ring, it's up or down by one. So he can adjust the value of the properties. That's a great strategy if you, especially if you accumulate some properties on the, the rural ring, then you consolidate to the suburban, then you consolidate to the urban, then you boost the, the value of everything on the urban ring by three and sell them off, you can make a ton of profit that way, okay? But you can manipulate them in other ways too. The last thing you could do on your turn is if you have reached your goal, if you have all the points you need in the industry that you're going for and you have either eliminated your debt or you have accumulated enough additional points to cover your debt, then you can, um, on your turn, at the beginning of your turn, declare victory. Now, of course, if somebody else has that uh, wealth goal, there's a possibility that they will cut in right then and let you know they have more wealth than you, um, and then they actually are the winner. But that's basically how you play Freedom Rings. Well, before I go any further, I just want to mention this is a prototype copy of the game that was provided to me by the publisher. However, I think it is very close, if not exactly, uh, what the finished product is going to look like. So hopefully uh, this review gives you a good idea of what the finished game, you know, what you can expect from the final product. Uh, just real quickly touching on the production values, I really like uh, everything about the production of the game. I mentioned already that the board, it's very very uh, bright and colorful. The graphic design is very uh, clear and clean, very modern looking. I like everything about that. The player pieces are a nice sturdy cardboard. Um, and again, bright colors that really pop off the board um, when you're looking at them in person. Um, there is that paper money, which is not the best thing, but it's definitely a step above your standard Monopoly money. Um, it's going to not get torn up in a couple of games. It'll, it'll last you a while. And I do appreciate that because the debt is represented by tokens. There's that distinction there between the, the, the cash money and the debt, right? So you don't get confused with that. So I appreciate that. There's some good things about this game and some bad things. So I'm going to start with the things that I'm not particularly fond of about the game. Um, the rules, I think, are fine, um, but they, there could be a little more clarity in the way they're written, especially when it comes to the power plays and those, those power player moves. Um, 
I was able to understand the rules um, just from reading through the rule book, but it did take a couple of reads. And it also required reading through the rule book and then looking at the available components and, and putting some critical thought into what can actually be done with these components on the board to come up with something that made sense to me that like, okay, this is how it works. All right. So there, there's a little lack of clarity there, but not a big deal. The main thing that I have a problem with in the game is the goal cards. And first of all, I like the idea of the goal cards. In fact, I really like the theme of this game. This is something that I've been wanting to see in an economic game for a while, because in an economic game, right, you've got your classic monopoly where it's about taking everybody else's money. And then you have a lot of other economic games where it's about um, having more money than everybody else after a certain number of rounds or something to that effect, right? You, you have a lot of economic games that work like this. This economic game comes at it from a different angle where you're not directly competing with everybody else to have more money than them or anything like that. You're really just given a goal to be very successful in a particular field, be it agriculture, you know, industry, um, you know, virtual tech, you know, right, technologies, whatever, right? You, you choose a field and your goal is to just be successful in that field. The amount of money you actually have is irrelevant. Um, it's just about meeting a certain like quota of success in your field and not having a ton of debt. And I like that because I am not an economist, I'm not a student of economic theory, but to me that just reflects what I see in the world around me. As a small business owner, I'm not concerned about making more money than Walmart or Amazon. I'm not even concerned about making more money than other people in my own industry. I'm just concerned about uh, making, you know, a reasonable amount of money and not having debt, right? That's it. That's my criteria for success as a business owner. So I like that this game reflects that through those goal cards. The reason I have a small problem with the goal cards is basically comes down to that wealth card. All the other cards play into what I just said about the theme of the game, but then the wealth card seems to fly you know, in the face of that because there, there's one card in the game that could mean any of the players at the table are instead actually going for the most wealth. So I feel like there's a bit of a, 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 a mismatch there when it comes to the theme. But more importantly than that, the mechanisms of that card bother me a little bit. So with that card, you can't just get a certain amount of wealth and then say, oh, I reached my goal, I win. Instead, you try to have more wealth than everybody else at the table. And then when somebody else declares victory because they reach their goal, then you kind of step in and interrupt them and say, actually, I have more money than you. I have more wealth than you, so I'm the real winner. That doesn't feel good when it happens to you. There's already enough tension at the table um, just because you don't know necessarily what goals other people are going for. And if you watch what other people are doing, you can kind of sort of figure it out like, oh, they're buying up a lot of that, uh, you know, manufacturing properties. So that's probably what they're going for. But even so, it's hard to keep track of um, since the point values that you're going for with each goal is different. Um, you know, it's hard to know, even if you figure this guy is probably going for this, it's hard to know really how close they are to reaching their goal. So it creates enough tension at the board already um, because you can see maybe like, okay, in, in like two more rounds, I can reach my goal if things work out the way I'm planning. But, um, you know, somebody else might beat me to it. So there's already enough tension there. I feel like that added tension of, okay, I reached my goal. I know I've got it but somebody else who's going for wealth could come in and take it away from me anyway, right? To me, that just doesn't feel good. And even if you're the player going for the wealth goal and you step in and steal the victory from someone else, that just doesn't feel great to me either, right? I'm sitting down with friends or family to enjoy a game and then that just feels like kind of a jerk move to be able to take their victory away from them at the last second like that. Now that's me and the people that I tend to play with. I know other groups are gonna get a kick out of that kind of play you know, uh, they're going to be able to take it all in good fun and enjoy that um, kind of backstabby sort of, you know, uh, slip in at the last moment and steal the, the victory from you. But that's just not me. The good thing about it, though, in my opinion, is that um, because it's just one card out of seven, if you don't like that style of play, you can easily play without that particular goal 
being an option. And everyone still has six different goals they can go for, still plenty of variety, and uh, it doesn't really change anything else about the game if you remove that particular goal. So there's that. Now, having covered all that, th those are basically my negatives for the game. So the positives for the game are, um, you know, like I said in the beginning, it sounds a lot like Monopoly when you start to describe it. But I am not personally a big fan of Monopoly, and I like how this game manages it to, to kind of capitalize on the familiarity of Monopoly and its mechanisms while avoiding a lot of the things that I don't like about Monopoly. So, for example, um, I like how on your turn, most of the time, you're going to roll a die, you're going to move, you're going to maybe pay rent if you happen to land on someone else's property, but then you're going to have an option about whether you purchase the property you landed on, if it wasn't already owned, or if you move to another property to purchase it. And it can be any property on that ring. Uh, so that's pretty cool, right? You're not just stuck with where you landed. Uh, if you're going for a particular thing, you can move around to that particular property to get it. I also like how you're never stuck in a situation where you'd like to buy a property, uh, but you don't have enough money to afford it because nobody starts out with any money and you can always take on more debt as much as you want in order to acquire the properties um, that you need. So that's really cool. I also like how at the beginning of your turn, you have the option, you know, which ring you want to play on. So not only do you have options after you roll the dice, but you even have options before you roll the dice. Do you want to move on, you know, the, the rural ring, the suburban ring, or the urban ring, right? So you can do that. You can make that decision based on how things are flowing in the game and what properties you're going after. Consolidating properties is another option, and that's really cool. It's neat how, you know, you can get those rings on, those properties on the, the rural ring and then consolidate them inward to get better value. That's a key strategy of the game, and it's fun, you know, to, to work through that. That's pretty neat. And it also keeps the game from becoming really stagnant, right? Someone might buy up a bunch of properties on, like, the rural ring, and so everybody else is landing on those properties and having to pay rent, but at some point, that player is going to want to start consolidating inward. And so uh, it's going to be unusual for the game to get kind of, like, locked in a state where everybody's paying rent to one person continuously, right? Because you've got to keep trading out properties for one another, right? To move in and gain value. The power player moves are pretty cool too. I find that the one where you change your goal, um, you have to work so hard to build up an, enough properties on a single ring to make that power player move um, that it's not easy to make those power player moves often. And at most, you're going to get to make three over the course of the game. So I feel like uh, being able to uh, switch your goal, it's like you're going to have to work so hard to even get to the point where you could switch your goal. It's going to be uncommon for people to use that power, in my experience. But the other two are really cool. Um, being able to adjust the interest rate, that's interesting, uh, especially if you're acquiring a lot of debt. You can bump the interest rate down to zero, and then you don't have to worry about paying interest at all on all that debt you've acquired. If you notice that somebody else is acquiring a lot of debt, but you aren't, you can bump the interest rate up to slow them down um, without really hurting yourself. And then of course, being able to adjust the value of the properties is really cool. Just to give you an idea how all of that plays out in a game, uh, one particular game that we were playing, one player had managed to acquire very little debt and another player had acquired a lot of debt buying up properties in that central urban ring where the properties are the most expensive. The player who had the very little debt made a power player move to up the interest rate from one to two. So he was going to double the interest rate um, for the player who had accumulated all this debt. And meanwhile, the player who had accumulated all that debt had been moving his guys around the, the rings. And he'd gotten to the point where on his next turn, whichever piece he ended up moving, he is going to have to push someone across that, that line and pay the interest, right? So it was a pretty strategic move that this other player made. But on the player who had all the debt on his very next turn, he had enough properties on one of the rings that he was able to make a power player move, raise the value of all the urban properties by three, of which he had a whole bunch, and he sold off all of them but a few, completely eliminated his debt, and had enough uh, properties to complete his goal on his next turn. So he ended up turning that around 
and winning the game. Um, and it was just, it was, it was a neat back and forth to see both players playing strategically, making use of those power player moves. So basically that's, that's the overview of Freedom Rings and what I think of it. Um, I think that it's a pretty neat economic game. It has a unique kind of theme to it with, you know, you're just trying to excel in your particular field while reducing debt. It's not about chasing the most money. Um, it's not about directly competing with one another over who has the most money. You know, it's just you have your field and you're trying to excel in that and to reduce that debt. There's interesting mechanisms in it. Yes, it's a roll and move, but that doesn't mean you don't have choices. You still have choices over which track you move on. And after you move, you can jump around to somewhere else on the track to buy the property that you want. You always have the ability to take on more debt to buy the properties you need in order to accomplish your goal. Consolidating the properties feels really cool and exciting. And of course, those power player moves are, are the most strategic part of the game. Again, it's going to be hard not to compare this to Monopoly. And I am not a fan of Monopoly. And I know a lot of the people in the hobby board gaming market are not fans of Monopoly. But I will emphasize that it does not actually feel like Monopoly in practice. And I think in this case, since the majority of people who are going to see this game um, will have been exposed to Monopoly at some point, I think that the familiarity actually helps the game more than it hinders it. So that's Freedom Rings. Again, my name is Nathan. You're watching Nice at Dice. Thank you so much for watching, and you enjoy the rest of your day.